going to recording exactly and you tell us when uh, we should stop we won't be till near the end so don't worry okay perfect so um well it's a pleasure to have uh, pat today uh, speaking um well pat almost needs no introduction but uh, it's only proper to uh, say that well he's the author of uh, many contributions that uh, we uh, have uh, well we all know uh, one way or another and that uh, we even sometimes love um his name also echoes with several uh, seminal contributions uh, in plasmas regarding well, shear regulation, zonal physics, predator-prey dynamics, transport or transport bifurcations. One of his uh, great uh, strengths also is to bridge uh, the, uh, the gaps with uh, other communities. So he has also uh, notable contributions in uh, astro and uh, fluid mechanics. And, uh, last but uh, not least, uh, he has a keen interest in uh, arts, cats, and politics. I don't know in which order. Um, cats first. Great. But regarding politics, at least, uh, maybe you were inspired early in your uh, reckless youth in Boston uh, by being almost a near classmate with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So maybe yes. sometime you can say something about that. So uh, with that, you have the floor. Thank you. But since you mentioned politics, thank you for the kind introduction. But I, I should say my first, the first political cartoon I remember vividly as a child was from when uh, President de Gaulle visited Canada and gave his Viva Quebec Libre speech. And there was a, a, a cartoon in the paper. It showed a huge nose sticking through a door and on the back of the door was written Canadian Internal Affairs. And I, I remember that I was about 10 years old and quite enjoyed it. So anyway, this, th there's, pl there's plenty to ridicule in politics these days. Anyway, this talk, some may be disappointed, some may be not. It's not about staircases and layering. I gave about more than 10 talks on them this winter. It, we'll touch on them a little bit, but the main event is elsewhere and it's on the birth and really mainly the death of shear layers. This is the advantage of these nice high tech things and their impact on transition, confinement transitions and particularly density limits. So you all, everyone I think here has been to many festivals or the uh, uh, KITP program and knows about the, the LH transition, but it ra heard rather less about density limits. So this is a series of work and I, there's not enough room in this long talk to include it all actually. Uh, with well, particularly Ramaswar Singh, who's here, and Rima Hajar, who went from predator prey to predator in GA, if you know what I mean, and Misha Malkov. And uh, on the experimental side, there are some results from Along Ting, who those of you who went to Chengdu will remember. And if you watch the IAEA meeting, she was the young woman catching the ball at the end of the meeting in the closing uh, scene that uh, was staged. And also builds on work with Rong Ji Hong and George. And I'll talk a little bit about some related stuff on the soul width, and in particular, uh, the question of the H mode density limit. And a lot of these last two are mo still moving. And if you want to see them in entirety, go to the Asian TTF coming up in early July. So we acknowledge particularly Martin Greenwald, but several other people, including Susanna, for discussions on RFPs and their behavior, uh, density limit behavior, and what we do and what we don't know about them. So I'm largely going to stay off RFPs here. They'll be for, for talks of the future. And if any of the non-MFE people are interested in sort of the background, there is an entire course, including the videos online by yours truly on magnetic confinement on the UCSD website. 
And for the MFE people who are interested in more of the theoretical foundations, you could go to the KITP website and see the bunch of us in action in the Staircase 21, which had a lot of it. So there's a lot of resources. So the outline will talk about things in common, an overview of the green wall density limit physics uh, from the point of view of particle transport then the theory of shear layer collapse. And in particular, wanna talk about from whence cometh the current scaling. And then I'll give you two sneak previews. One is on what I might in the language of the time call the second wave JTEXT experiments done by Long Ting, quite recent results. And it's interesting when you start to, to look for something, even if you don't find it, you find something else that's interesting. And, you know, this is an illustration of experiments versus bird watching. And last but not least, I will talk some, uh, if we have time, about the H mode density limit and some work we have going there, which feeds into density limits. So whenever we talk about commonalities, the the famous opening of Anna Karenina comes to mind, right? So I would modify this with apologies to Lev Tolstoy and say, there are no good tokamaks. All tokamaks do have certain things in common and not but, and each tokamak is diabolical in its own unique way. So the things in common, which are nicely laid out in a recent review that by John Rice, uh, which really spans his entire career and uh, Norman and I and a few other Greenwald are uh, among the other perpetrators. And uh, I recommend to you, and the review has an interesting history, which I don't think we want recorded right now, but the things in common are a, linear ohmic confinement to saturated ohmic confinement transition. So when I entered this field, people were busy making plots of the confinement time versus things. And you know, one of the more famous ones was as you raise the density in an ohmic tokamak, the confinement time increased. And this fortuitous trend continued until it saturated. And the saturation was due to coupling of energy to the ions, right? It's one of the most basic trends called the lock sock transition. And it was later beaten by pellet injection in a very famous experiment by Martin Greenwald and friends on Alcator C that put the ITG mode in business. So you guys, if you, if you wonder why ITG is taken seriously, this is why. And at around this lock sock transition comes intrinsic rotation reversals. So you probably heard the plasma through Reynolds stresses likes to generate its own rotation, basically conversion of, of heat flux via like a thermodynamic engine to, it, to rotation. And around the same point as the lock sock transition, there is an, a, a flip in the direction of the intrinsic rotation. Maybe more importantly for this crowd, since it's, you know, walking range from eater, there is a minimum in the threshold power for the LH transition, you know, that is, uh, and that also is at a density that's in the ballpark of this lock sock transition density. And last but not least, there is something called a density limit. In other words, there's a limit on the line average density that can be supported. And uh, Dr. Rice points out that items one through four of the previous can be unified by the scaling n crit qr equal b toroidal, right? And so that says whatever the uh, the density for the phenomenon in question, it's, it can be written as n over what I'll call ng equals a constant. And ng proportional to the plasma current is the unifying scaling for the for ohmic phenomenology. And this, this limiting density, in other words, the so-called density limit is called the Greenwald limit for in the name of the person who discovered it. <clears throat> 
So this, this is in some sense a calibration point for many important things in an omic tokamak. Something else that is that everybody has in common, and as does Stellarators, as a point as pointed out by Carlos Hidalgo. And the the RFP case is, shall we say, still open, I think is fair to say. So I don't go there today. Uh, they, there is an edge shear layer. And this shear layer is evident with the last closed flux surface in most tokamak operating regimes. I see it as being discovered by Christoph Ritz on text, not JE text, text in 1984. I think uh, very few of you were functioning then. And this shear layer impacts and regulates edge turbulence even in omic or low mode confinement. This is not the shear layer of the H mode, which you've probably heard about, which is very strong. This is a weaker shear layer, but it's nevertheless present. So here, as you know, there was an interesting paper by Ritz of circa 1990 when the big fracas over the H mode started. And the paper was uh, entitled Evidence for Confinement Improvement by Velocity Shear Suppression of Edge Turbulence. And this was all in L mode. So you get the picture. I mean, you see, you see a sh the direction of the fluctuations changing, you know, in a layer near the edge. And the peak correlation takes a dip right in the region of the shear layer. And you, if you plot the gradient in the shear, there's a maximum in the flow, there's a maximum here and then the density is rising. So it's a, it's a fairly robust phenomena and it's seen in all, basically all tokamaks and stellarators with some modifications in stellarators for the neoclassical. Why should it form? It's not hard to see it. I mean, for reason, because you have a heat flux or a power, you know, a power input of some form that has to ultimately be balanced by losses, there's always strong fluctuations near the edge, except in H mode, which I mean, in which case you get a much stronger shear layer. And that, those strong fluctuations mean the intensity is rising, which means the Reynolds force, which is basically related to the gradient of the intensity can also rise. There's also a transition to a sheath, et cetera, beyond the last closed flux surface. And I'm staying mainly in tokamak uh, uh, world here, but I can tell you there's a series of papers by Carlos on, uh, laying out in great detail uh, the corresponding thing for stellarators. It's clearly uh, universal. And the point you should get is forgetting H mode, forgetting H mode, without the shear layer, L mode confinement would be worse. I mean, this shear layer is already doing something to regulate confinement at the boundary. So to give you a preview of where we're going, where what we're going for is to argue that a unifying picture of tokamak operation is, in, is one in which the edge shear emerges as the relevant order parameter. And you have a picture where you have a modest shear in L mode. I make no differentiation between L mode or omic. I mean, the, the type of power doesn't matter. You have a modest or weak shear in L mode or omic going to strong shear in H mode, developing a strong mean shear, and then vanishing in regimes of high density, which uh, we associate with the density limit, okay? And this is somewhat of a radical view on the matter of the density limit, or, or maybe not so radical, but when maybe when we started, it was radical because the conventional story of the density limit is variations on a theme of a mode for every phenomena. A typical paper is the Drake and Rogers. 
where they have collisional drift waves in L mode. And then they say at some point it becomes resistive ballooning. And in H mode, it's finite beta collisional drift waves. Collisional drift waves are Hasegawa Wakatani for our friends. And this resistive ballooning is a beta driven thing. And there's a lot of phenomena that uh, of density limit for, or most density limit phenomena where the beta simply isn't high enough to get in the ballpark for that, by the way. So sort of the thrust of where I'm going is to explore the edge shear as the characteristic order parameter with, with the emphasis on this end, going from L to density, having going from L to H, of course, you've heard many talks on and I've given many talks on, so we'll save that for another day. So let's, let's talk about density limit phenomena, the Greenwald limit. First of all, it is exceedingly important. It's a one of many major issues for ITER. Uh, some version of ITER was planned to operate above the density limit, which was an interesting one. And the density limit is simply a relation between the line average density and the current, okay? And it was discovered by Martin Greenwald. And clearly density limits are attractive because you know n tau t is the magic number, beta, which is nt over b squared is the magic number. So high n is good. It's a constraint on a tokamak operation. It's manifested in other devices. Both RFPs and stellarators exhibit density limits. Uh, it is a line average limit in the form I'm saying. It's pathetically simple. The critics might say it's not even a dimensionless parameter. We'll do something about that in the course of the talk. And the other thing that's striking is the origin of the current scaling. And I've mentioned stellarators, and then you might ask, well, gee, what happens in stellarators no current? And I can offer you something on that, but at the end. And while it is a line average, I should say it is intimately wrapped up with the edge because of most, most fueling, getting the particles in is via the edge. So edge transport is critical to density limits. And by the way, uh, on the subject of how the particles can get in, I can relate to the non-fusion people. If you remember Edgar's talk, on binary convection, he made a point at the end, well, this is not negative diffusion, it's fundamentally off diagonal. And that's the name of the game in this thing, the particle pinch, right? Where in basically an up gradient density flux is driven by some form of a down gradient heat flux. And it's exactly the same thing. And those of you who are in, who know about chemotaxis, it's identical to chemotaxis. And in my latest course on this stuff, I introduced it via an analogy with the Keller-Siegel paper, which predated, by the way, any, any stuff on pinches in fusion. So I think you guys yeah, from out from uh, other areas can get the picture. So. A brief history of density limits. It's an old story. There are many density limits. I remember as coming as a student hearing about the Murakami and with Callan limit and the Hugel limit and a few others. And these are pretty much evolutionary dead ends. Uh, you don't hear about them anymore. Uh, but like they were based on the other ideas and, but, you know, just as like Neanderthal DNA is in the genome, well, some of these ideas are still in the intellectual genome by some who are more Neanderthalic than others. A good way to understand the origin of the survivor was, is Greenwald's POP, 20 years of Alcator CMOD and Greenwald's, analysis emerged in the late 80s. You might ask, where does it come from? What led him to see current as the key? And as far as I can tell, it was from the fact they were greatly concerned with discharge termination studies on Alcator C, which had a hell of a lot of 
current and current density relative to other tokamaks, particularly current density at that time. That was the mid, mid well, early to, early to late 80s, actually. Alcator C was the 80s. And what he noted in studying, you know, termination was the density tracked the current consistently. And by the way, tracked it without any wild stuff going on. So with that observation, the regression plots followed. Now, the, con the, the, the conventional wisdom of density limits has always been, well, you have high density, and this leads to edge cooling. By the way, something has to happen to make that true, and that something is transport, which we'll return to. But cooling the edge then can introduce or cause the occurrence of something called the MARF, which does not mean uh, that uh, uh, what you might think it means. It means multifaceted axisymmetric radiation from the edge. And of course, I should note it was discovered by Earl Marmar and Steve Wolf. So that might be another uh, way of looking at its origin. And it is nothing more for our friends outside fusion. It is nothing more than a radiative condensation instability in a strong field. So in fact, if you go back to George Field, 64 on radiative condensation instabilities in the interstellar medium, you go to a strong B field and face the geometry, you will come to the beginnings of a MARF model. And this is exactly what was done by Jim Drake in 87. And of course, it's the anisotropic heat conduction that's the key. And then you go from MARF to the radiation contracting the current profile, producing tearing in an island and making a disruption. And this story had its beginnings with uh, a name familiar in France, Paul-Henri Rebou. Uh, he's, a, he's a polytechnician, I discovered, not a real Normalian, but I, I can mention him anyway, I think. Uh, uh, and he was the one who advocated the started this trend toward uh, radiation driven tearing in islands, which continues today. But from the beginning, it was apparent that more than macroscopics was going on because there were cases where the dense, you couldn't raise the density and there were no MARFs. There were cases where there was MARF, but no tearing. There were cases with tearing and no MARF. It was kind of, it was, it was a MARF, okay, hence the name. So early on, Greenwald figured out that edge particle transport is fundamental, right? And that's where we're going. And kind of put together an idea of disruptive scenarios where a secondary outcome, largely a consequence of edge cooling following fueling and increased particle transport. And the, the density limit reflects a fundamental limit imposed by particle transport, okay? And there was an interesting experiment, as usual, not enough, dating back again, that's not a typo, that's Alcator C, where you, you know, Greenwald could shoot in large pellets, he could shoot in small pellets. And, oh my, and what he found, was you shoot shallow pellets with shallow penetration, the density would decay without disruption after shallow pellet injection. And the density it would decay to would asymptote to, would, to a various level that scaled with current. So the, the suspicion then is the density limit is enforced by transport induced relaxation. Pity rates and fluctuations were not studied in these experiments. There were more um, in the perturbative transport arenas where you studied the decay time, the post pellet decay time as a function of J over N, sort of J over N being the relevant ratio. And uh, 
you know, obviously the larger J over N was the longer the decay time because larger current relative to density means you could hold more density. Low J over N had short decay time. Again, it's a pity that there was never uh, fluctuation studies during this, but that will be remedied. Then following on my neighbors in San Diego revisited the topic now with large pellets in D3D. And it's puzzling to me why this was never done on Alcator C given their, given their interest in pellet injection, but there were a series of experiments by Panit Gohill and Keith Burrell, where you can see they just increased the line average density and managed to achieve really a substantial exceedance of the green walled limit. And they did this by generating peak profiles and those peak profiles would, this was in, I believe, a, a, you know, an omic saturation type of plasma. Those peak profiles would knock out any ITG turbulence by lowering lowering the A to I parameter, the ratio of the, the, temp, the density gradient scale length to the temperature gradient scale length. And these would lead then lead to reduced particle transport, which unfortunately led to impurity accumulation. So if you're asking that the, this sort of death at the end was due to the impurity accumulation. And fluctuation studies began, and I better speed up. So I'm going to talk about, skip that one. So then there was a trend beginning about 10 years ago toward microphysics, which gets a lot more interesting. It's, it's disappointing that a lot of that early work was done uh, really without fluctuation studies. One of the more interesting things as works was by Yu Hong Shu et al. I think et was Carlos, where, I mean, the main point is, so he studied what he called the long range correlation, which is basically the coherence of two probes widely separated in the plasma. And that is more or less an indicator that coherence is a more or less an indicator of the role of zonal flows, right? Because only zonal flows could maintain such, such a coherence. And what he found as he raised the, the density toward the green walled limit, the long range correlation decayed, okay? So uh, it, at high density, the LRC, which can also be associated with GAMS dropped rapidly with increasing density. And the reduction in L LRC due to increasing density is, was accompanied by a reduction in the mean radial electric field. So this begs the question, remember the shear layer is the density limit related to the edge shear layer decay. Now there was a, not a density limit experiment, but a very nice little experiment by Schmidt and Mons. I, I, by the way, should add, there are many other works dancing around this at that time period, by the way, all associated with Carlos. I mean, the papers by Pedrosa, Hidalgo, another one by Carreras. Uh, but the connection of the larger picture had not been made yet. There was a nice experiment on a stellarator, by the way, by Schmidt and Mons. And the punchline here was a collisionality scan, really, that is a scan of adiabaticity, right? In other words, it's a study of parameters such that will the density response to the uh, potential fluctuation uh, be more Boltzmann-like or non-Boltzmann-like, and then what is the fate of the, of the zonal flows in that state? And well, not a particularly surprise, what they found was that high collisionality, low adiabaticity, the power in the zonal flows over the total fluctuation power dropped precipitously. And by the way, the fluctuation symmetries was largely restored, right? So in other words, if, rather than having these tilted eddies, that you got sort of more, more symmetric things, which then is suggestive. The absence of a tilt is suggestive of there's no Reynolds stress generation at work, which then is consistent with the dropping of the fluctuation levels. 
So I think the first paper that start really to put it together was by Rong Ji Hong and he or at is time and then all is me. And these were a set of experiments on HL2A. HL2A, by the way, in case you don't know, is the second life of ASDEX, the first ASDEX, now re re reincarnated in Chengdu. So the first thing you see here is the, the, the same kind of study of symmetry or in lack thereof, and the tilt symmetry is lost and the oh, kind of spherical symmetry or circular symmetry is restored as N goes to NG. So you're gonna see a comparison of three points approaching the green wall limit. And this is a symptom of weakened shear flow production by Reynolds stress. And it seems that the key parameter is adi electron adiabaticity. And so there's two nice graphs. One is the graph of the Reynolds power, which is effectively the work or the power exerted by the Reynolds force. And you see that just falls through the floor as the electrons go non-adiabatic. And that, of course, can be accomplished by raising the density in nu. And likewise, the particle flux shoots up like gangbusters when the electrons go non-adiabatic. So it's suggesting that what's going on is you collapse the zonal flows and thus eliminate the self-regulation of the system and the flux goes up and you get a degradation of particle confinement. The pictures of the transport quantities are more impressive than the pictures, well, uh, you know, the, the plots versus radius. By the way, these things are, are the points at the separatrix, but you can see the same trend in red, blue, and green laid out here, okay? And the, param the parameters in this system were such that the plasma beta was very low, and you can't forget it on resistive ballooning. So what's the synthesis? Shear layer collapse and particle transport seem to be rising as N over N green wall go to one. And this seems to be, the shear layer collapse seems to be the key microphysics of the density limit. And then this can trigger cooling and MARFs and all those other things. A key parameter, but when you think about it, it can't be the only key parameter. But in these, in these older omic type plasmas, the key parameter does seem to be the adiabaticity parameter alpha and its transition from greater than one to less than one. I mean, in this, in this experiment, the, uh, the Hong experiment, alpha went from three to, point oh, to 0 0.5 in the N over N Greenwald scan, okay? The interesting thing here is the decline of the, of the zonal flow seems to come via an effect on production, right? In other words, do you, oh, people say, oh yeah, the damping went up. Well, that's really not the point. The production went down. That's the significance of the Reynolds work decline. And the degradation of confinement at the density limit is due to breakdown of self-regulation by the zonal flow. So we're headed back to our friend, the predator prey, now focusing on death, right? The collapse or the back transition. So how do we reconcile all these things with our understanding of uh, drift wave zonal flow physics? And so I think few questions here. I think this basically is saying what I just said, so I can skip it. One of the things we want to talk about is what of high density, uh, excuse me, higher adiabaticity, but high density. In other words, we in cases where, you know, this parameter scales as T squared over N, so it, one might eventually want to bring auxiliary heating to separate, to stress the T squared a little harder, but we'll come to that. So we have a, a theory of shear layer collapse. So a simple generic model is Hasegawa Wakatani. I notice even our friends from outside the field 
our learning about Hasegawa Wakatani and uh, had collisional drift waves, uh, which can be pushed in a variety of limits. So it's one generic model in multiple limits versus changing the mode for every regime you want, you need, which doesn't seem very satisfactory. And I would say a point for our friends outside the field are, are that the mean field equations in Hasegawa Wakatani are different from the fluctuation equations because the mean fields, of course, have no, have no K parallel. Okay, so that's an important point. And of course, Reynolds stress is related to vorticity flux by the Taylor identity. And an important characteristic of Hasegawa Wakatani is that it exhibits fluctuations of two structures in the large alpha or adiabatic limit. You have conventional drift waves and drift instabilities. And for small alpha, you have more convective cells with comparable real and imaginary parts. And these uh, in terms of real and imaginary parts of the frequency. The others are clearly waves, which, which much stronger real part than imaginary part. So there's a fundamental difference here. And so the numerics clearly shows fundamental difference between these two regimes. You can see various guilty parties here, one of which is with us today. And all note a weakening or collapse of ordered shear flow in the hydrodynamic regime, which uh, in, in that regime, you resemble more a 2D vortex turbulence, but not much attention to the physics of collapse as the focus was on the adiabatic regime where you got zonal flows. So we're interested in why you don't get zonal flows. So let me step back in, in the spirit of a tutorial uh, why are zonal flows ubiquitous, right? I mean, we're all talking about zonal flows all the time, and it's only a short step, no pun intended, from the zonal flow to the staircase. Well, I think an explanation that I'm fond of is simply that if you look at the energy flux and cause that the wave energy flux and causality. If you have an excitation, causality says you have to have outgoing waves, and those outgoing waves propagate energy at the group velocity, which is proportional to the kx ky product, which is also this product appears with a sign in the momentum flux. So what it says is it is kind of unavoidable that outgoing wave propagation will then produce incoming moment, uh, momentum flux. So uh, outgoing waves will generate a flow convergence and that gives you a shear layer spin up. And you get bands because of course, as you're bringing in momentum from out here to here, you spin up here, but of course you got to balance the momentum budget so you lose it out there. So that kind of breaks the system up into bands. And this property is a consequence of this nicely behaved drift wave, Rossby wave dispersion relation. If you look at this for hydrodynamic convective cells, this nice relation between the group velocity and the Reynolds stress is broken. It becomes a, quite an ugly mess keeping, you know, when you keep track of everything and there is no simple proportionality between uh, energy flux and momentum flux. So eddy tilting really does not arise as a direct consequence of causality. And that's another way of looking at, at the origin of zonal flows, that they come from eddy tilting, which is in essence a context of uh, a consequence of causality. So zonal flow generation is not a natural outcome in the hydrodynamic regimes and the physical picture of the shear flow collapses. Now, the theorists here may be saying, oh, that's all well and good, but how do you, uh, how do you reconcile that with the PV budget, you know, fa face Cambridge and Bow and all that? Well, you've got to realize 
Here in these in Hasegawa Wakatani in drift waves, the PV budget is log n, the mean profile, the non adiabatic electron response, phi, and vorticity. So if you look at the total PV flux up here, right, there's a flux of density, and the, the adiabatic electrons contribute nothing to the flux of density, but the non-adiabatic do, and there's a flux of vorticity. Okay, so in the adiabatic limit, these two pieces are tightly coupled. So if you move, you know, in the weak non-adiabatic response, if you move a few particles, you have to generate a flow. In the hydrodynamic limit where alpha is small, these two are very weak. These two go from being tightly coupled to very weakly coupled. So the upshot is you can transport the PV flux basically through the particle flux and you don't need to do anything with the zonal flow. And you still respect PV balance and we still respect balance of the overall PV flux. And I'll go quickly through this. There's more interesting stuff ahead. Uh, one can generate one of these Bly-like models that we cooked up for staircases. By the way, I would direct you to a paper just advertising a bit by Jia Tong Li and I that explored zonal flow saturation in the limit of zero collisional damping through the mechanism of wave flow resonance is, is potentially relevant to many of these problems. But anyway, as before, and all these things are the same in my position, some, my opinion, the wave kinetics or working with potential entropy and all is it effectively the same for zonal symmetry. So the natural description is a mean density, a mean vorticity, and a potential entropy fluctuation. And you go off with the three equations in the mean field evolution. You can have the bistable mixing, but it won't be relevant here unless you want to push the model into something like an H-mode regime. And off you go, and you get... Uh, you know, you get cup, you basically coupled evolution of the particle flux, the vorticity flux, and the turbulence spreading. And of course, the vorticity flux includes a diffusion and a residual, the residual driven by the density gradient. And all of these have a clear dependence on omega and alpha. And you can read Rima's and Ramaswar's paper on that. But the critical point is the vorticity gradient, which emerges in these theories as the order parameter for the flow, is independent of alpha in the adiabatic limit, but scales with alpha for alpha small in the hydrodynamic limit, which means the, that's saying also what we knew by simpler means that the flow is falling apart in the hydrodynamic limit. Now, an interesting thing I, I notice, uh, I notice uh, Robin is here, and he was a, he's a big fan of vorticity gradients. And it's an interesting question that merits more thought, I think. I mean, it seems that vorticity gradients is strong, maybe a strong, it, it is a stronger flow order parameter than flow shear. And point is a, a vorticity gradient, if you will, forces a jump in the flow shear over the scale of the vorticity gradient. So the vorticity gradient prevents a global alignment of eddies or modes with the uniform shear. Okay, so that in some sense, that's one way a system can dodge shear. And if the shear is varying, it makes it harder for it to dodge. And the standard interpretation of the vorticity gradient is due to our friend Michael McIntyre, right? It, it give, produces enhanced drift wave elasticity, gives an enhanced, the enhanced vorticity gradient converts the turbulence to waves, so reduces mixing. So it's instead of Rossby wave elasticity, it's, uh, uh, drift wave elasticity. So 
All right, you say, all well and good if you say that, but where's the current coming from? And what do you do? I mean, this alpha less than one regime is rather special, although it pops up as you shall see. And where's that dimensionless parameter, you say? So this, the current scaling, the natural candidate is to consider the neoclassical dielectric effects on the zonal or shear flow response. So to bring the neoclassical screening, which I think all the fusion people uh, know is there, uh, by the way, and this introduces the poloidal gyro radius with some diddle factors as the natural screening, screening length, okay? And that then says the effective zonal flow inertia becomes lower for larger plasma current. And larger plasma current is of course better to hold more density, but lower inertia means you get a stronger zonal flow response. So you maintain the barrier. The other thing about this line is it brings the key to the stellarator. I mean, people in looking at the stellarator have been trying to do things saying, well, it's current for tokamax, let's look at iota. And well, I don't think that's going to work. The right thing to do is to look at the screening length for zonal flows in a stellarator, which by the way, for LHD, one case I did look into with the help of Tomohiko Watanabe, the screening length is classical, which may explain the whoppingly large density limit achieved on LHD, but we'll leave that uh, for future talks. So anyway, you can easily you know, get on with this. What's interesting about this is a, a way to, to sort of easily see the role of the screening is to look at the zonal noise. I mean, we rarely look at the, zone, at the noise or incoherent emission in the zonal flow business. It appears in the seminal paper of Rosenbluth and Hinton, but most of us have been off busily predatoring and praying and wave kinetics and why. But there is an important effect of, of basically incoherent uh, emission and mode coupling. And when you look at this, of course, the importance of the screening stares you in the face. And this, uh, this contribution then develops very strong, you know, colloidal field scaling. If you go from here, the effective E phi over T to the, to the effective zonal flow shear, again, almost reading it from Rosenbluth and Hinton, you, you find a rho theta I downstairs, which gives you a B theta squared, which then that's going to jack up the shear with the, with the uh, poloidal gyro, uh, with the poloidal magnetic field. So higher current strengthens the zonal flow shear for fixed drive, and it can prop it up against weaker production. And then you say, what about collisionality? Well, really, of course, you really want to look at three regimes. What I talked about for Rosenbluth and Hinton is banana. And then there's also plateau and there's fierce Schluter. It turns out most edges, even in omic, are in the plateau, right? And you say, how can that be? But there's a, there's a feature of omic edges with Ti bigger than Te. So we bring Ramaswar to the rescue and cranked out the Rosenbluth Hinton calculation in the, in the uh, plateau regime. And you basically get the banana scaling with a numerical reduction factor. Okay, so the overall picture is a heavy, uh, you know, a heavy screening cloud in the banana regime, a weaker screening, but still with favorable current in the plateau regime, and then fierce Schluter uh, regime only do you go back to classical. And by the way, GAMS can manifest this favorable trend with current as well. So the other point is you mentioned noise and Speaking of broader things, uh, I would direct you to a paper by Ramaswar and I, which is a long paper on 
kind of putting together the modulation and the noise analysis, which has, as far as I can tell, has never been done. You have one group of people calculating noise, you have another group of people calculating modulational stability and playing with wave kinetics, and rarely the two shall meet. And, you know, I would, this is something we started, but if you remember the KITP program, many of you here were in that, Brian Farrell kept stressing critical opalescence phenomena, and that's where this goes. So anyway, one can, that, that's a long story. You can have it as a tutorial in the next Real Fest. I recommend you send out, send out for lunch if you do. Let me give you the punchlines. Zonal flows and turbulence always coexist. Uh, zonal flow energy will increase with the current. We can show you that. The turbulence energy never reaches the old modulation threshold. And particularly for the staircase fans, the zonal cross correlation, in other words, the cross correlation of vorticity and density is of, uh, appears as an important parameter and its effect on say staircases, I think is TBD. But with the idea of, of simple shear layer collapse, we can go back to the old sort of zero D predator prey model where it all started. And now though we revisit the coefficients. And this is something I've been trying to get other people to do for a long time and they never did it, so we did it. So in particular, current scaling appears prominently in the coupling coefficient relating shearing to turbulence energy, right? This scales with B theta squared and the same here. And it appears prominently as I just showed you in the, in the coefficient for noise that goes as B theta to the fourth. So, I mean, properly bringing the current scaling through in the predator prey dynamics, I think makes a large impact. And one can, you know, basically take the criterion for zonal flow collapse from this old paper. There's a clear criterion for the existence of two roots and do the same calculation here. And one can factor in the noise. And in the region of collapse, the noise doesn't make too much of a difference. In the region of, you know, away from collapse, it's more important. And you arrive at a shear layer persistence criterion, which we think is very interesting. And that criterion is the ratio of, is an inequality between the dimensionless parameter rho sub s over rho theta ln geometric mean bigger than a mess, which we'll call crit. And the mess includes the zonal flow damping, includes adiabaticity, includes the coherence time, and includes some coefficients in the model. But you'll note that's a one quarter power. There isn't strong dependence there. And this to us seems like maybe this is a step toward a dimensionless parameter for the density limit, right? And you'll note, you'll note the structure and the role of poloidal field here. In other words, larger poloidal field will enhance per, uh, persistence of the zonal flow. And you can determine a critical particle source strength. To, in other words, how hard do you have to drive it to guarantee collapse? And you can compute that. And by the way, that scales with, uh, uh, so, uh, do, 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 I think I got the sign of this wrong here. Because higher, I have this upside down. This should be rho i over rho theta. Anyway, this one I'm, you've got here, you can convert it to a local density limit, a local limit on the edge density, which says that n has to be less than something of rho s over rho theta, the source strength to the one third and various other factors. And this clearly scales with IP. So this, not saying this is the green walled limit, but it is a limit on the local edge density 
that is imposed by considerations of collapse of the edge shear layer in the regime of alpha bigger than one and can be, you know, can be increased by running at high current. And neoclassical screening is the key to this result. Absolutely. Now, there are more things to say, including some simulations from Misha, but I'm running out of time. I want to go to at least one, one set of new results on the experiments, which I think is interesting. So, Oscar, why don't you kill the recording here? This don't, you know, don't worry about it. I think what I'll do is I'll send you the slides and you can post them, but maybe wait a month till we get that paper out, okay? okay. But uh, anyway, just in L mode, a nice little study of two cases at different currents. And again, the study of the turbulence spreading, obviously at, at higher current, less spreading, lower current, more spreading. And an interesting correlation between the width of the scrape off layer in L mode and the power spectral density of the fluctuations in, in, inside the separatrix and the points separate quite nicely. So the sole width is larger for stronger turbulence, uh, edge turbulence levels at the, you know, inside the separatrix. So this suggests there may be something to the spread, uh, the idea of spreading, relieving the, uh, the, uh, the Goldston problem. However, however, there is no free lunch. And here comes the HDL. If you broaden the layer, you weaken the, the shearing effect in the layer. If you weaken the shearing effect in the layer, then the fluctuations can grow in the layer. And though, you know, a critical idea in this is that excessive turbulence in the scrape off layer then could in a sense become the tail that wags the dog, invade the pedestal and kill the H mode and hence give the H, to, the H mode density limit. So in some sense, it's saying you really need to find the sweet spot, right? Where you broaden the layer, but not no much, not so much that you kill its stability. So I, in the end, I'm kind of in the same boat as Goldston. I'm making a kind of a pessimistic prediction. I think it would be interesting, you know, to study spreading from the layer to the core. I mean, if you can do what's been done here, you can do that. You can probably certainly stick probes in the scrape off layer in H mode and look at the direction of the, of the flux of turbulence intensity. Another point that Goldston has not talked about is that there are two levels here, namely the level for onset and the level for invasion. And what is the gap between the two? So let me come to the end. So conclusions, density limit macroscopics are rooted in the microphysics of particle transport, edge turbulence, and the shear layer. Shear layer collapse seems to us to be the origin of the enhanced particle transport. Electron adiabaticity, neoclassical screening, incoherent emission, zonal flow damping all enter the dynamics of zonal flow collapse. And our beloved predator prey model is a unifying structure. A attractive dimensionless parameter, which is maybe characteristic of Greenwald limit behavior is coined. Rho S over Rho theta LN, a geometric mean. And a, a how appropriate a second wave of fluctuation experiments identifies the production ratio, enhanced spreading, and the transition from alpha greater to less than one, and the appearance of quasi-coherent phenomena as, as sort of key, key signatures, and turbulence spreading across the separatrix, which seems to me to be conceptually treated as a DMZ, may mitigate 
the, uh, the Goldston heat load pessimism, but too much of it will give you strong enough broadening that kills the shear stabilization and may drive you to the HDL. So looking ahead, so one thing, this gets into question. Someone's gonna ask, gee, if it's the shear layer, why don't you bias? So obviously we thought of that. That's ongoing. We had one run on that in which the bias worked, but not very well. In other words, it did increase the density limit, but not a whole lot. And the problem was the bloody probe. So now we have a better probe and actually still being shaken out. Uh, Curry is in Hust as we speak. And uh, he did better on the first run with the, with the new probe than we did previously. So it's up to sort of beating, beating Greenwald by 20%, but there's plenty of room in the voltage on the probe to do better. So we shall see. The other thing is, of course, is to do, is now to switch from ohmic to L mode with auxiliary power and look at the collapse physics, in particular to stress T squared, in some sense, just to separate heat from particles as the drive. We would like to revisit these perturbation experiments and HL2A has a one, they don't have pellets, but they have this thing SMBI, which is like a blowgun, and they have siege cluster jet, you know, small pellet experiments, which are, I think, potentially ideal for looking at these games that uh, were played before, but this time with fluctuations. And as I said, we want to look in H mode at the, at the tail versus dog problem and the H mode density limit. It would be interesting to see under what conditions, if any, you reverse the, the direction of turbulence spreading uh, in H mode. Okay, in other words, can you find soul to core spreading as Goldston is, is speculating? Actually, that's me speculating that. The other interesting thing in all this is the negative triangularity, which uh, has various interesting features that could be relevant to density limits. And if you buy the zonal flow story, the negative triangularity is more omnigenous than a normal tokamak. And what that means, the drift surfaces and the flux surfaces are more aligned. Which means, in, which means effectively the drift off the flux surface is going to be lower, which means the zonal flow inertia is going to be lower, which means for equal drive, the zonal flow should be stronger in a negative T, which means you might get a higher density limit if you go down this road. And all the analysis that I've seen on the negative T is always quoting, you know, the drift, uh, the 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 CTEM and the drift reversal, which, you know, in other words, that you you uh, well not reversal, but you push the resonant particles to very high energy and you mitigate the CTEM, but we have a hard time getting a straight story on the ITG, and it would seem to me for the edge, the ITG is potentially. Uh, a very, you know, a, a, in, a, in a heated negative T is a, is a serious player. And that's, that's also something that would be very interesting to look at and uh, would be interesting maybe in upcoming studies in D3D if they let us in the door. So that's all folks. Thank you for your patience. I ran over some. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm sure there are going to be questions. If anyone's alive. We actually have more, but anyway. Okay, first, <clears throat> Xavier. Ah, here I am. Uh, well, I'm not the best expert you could think of uh, for density limit, but uh, I thought that in general, it leads to disruption and start with uh, an MHD event. So that's probably the reason why uh, Rebu got interested in uh, the tearing mode destabilized by uh, radiation cooling. So in this picture, with, with, which is basically a transport limit, uh, we, itself due to a shear collapse, shear layer collapse, uh, how, how does it go for, for the MHD? Uh, 
if any. Well, I mean, if this look, if you have shear layer collapse, you have enhanced turbulence. So you have enhanced particle transport, and you're going to get enhanced heat transport too, right? The heat, the the heat go, the the density fluctuations. Well, the the it's electrostatic fluctuations. The two are going to go together. Heat transport leads to cooling. Last I heard. So then the the heat the heat transport re, uh, will be triggered by the uh, shear layer collapse can lead to cooling can lead to the MARF can lead to the MHD. Okay, so that's the usual story. I mean, yeah. oh, but then I have, yeah. but I'm, yeah. the point is it need not right. Remember this this little picture and is I think the. Uh, it's the one bad thing about the iPad I don't like. This was the point of Mr. Greenwald, right? That he had some intuition that this was the, the truth, but not the whole truth. And he tried shallow pellet injection and he found a reversion you know, in other words, the particles were kicked out, but without the MHD. That's the point. But so this is. I have a, a second question, if the chair allows me. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, there is, as you certainly know. Michael, is, uh, uh, let yes? me add one other thing to my my answer. Yes. Uh, in the studies on JTEXT, we had the magnetic signals too, and not, I mean, there was a signal, but there was no change, absolutely no change in the scan of N over N Greenwald, of N over N Greenwald. It just stayed at the same. Uh -huh. Not even a low M, M N mode at some point? Uh, well, it's there, but it didn't change. I see. We had a scan going from well below to the same thing, and it sat there, and it didn't go up or anything. You see, I see. I see. Anyway, as as the, the thing, there is another. There are plenty of explanations which have been proposed, but you know, all these bunch of guys uh, who works on diverter proposed another uh, type of explanation that was basically, you know, that when you move to high density neutrals, we penetrate from the diverter to to the edge. And there are two consequences we derive. One is radiation, but also I would expect, uh, you know, a strong break breakdown of zonal flows due to uh, charge exchange, massive charge exchange uh, friction. So how would you make the difference between those two? Ah, uh, just wait. No, we've done that. Thank you. You're very uh, well. I uh, let's see where is the relevant page here. There is in this criterion that is derived here, if the flow, you remember the flow damping ap appears in that criterion and there is a variation in the criterion for charge exchange friction. Uh -huh. Okay. I see. So mm -hmm. and, that, and that is in our paper that is published. So you I can uh, consume for yourself. And does it play uh, an important role? Because of course, it needs to be in plenty of places. But um, is well, it I mean, it, hmm. it's crucial. Depending, uh, it depends basically on what's the dominant zonal flow damping mechanism, right? In other words, hmm. if it's if if charge exchange is the dominant mechanism, then it's crucial. If it's not, it isn't. So hmm. you mean you. The numbers and we figure out which which damping mechanism is dominant and it's crucial in that regime yes mm -hmm. and there's different there's slightly different scalings too not conceptually different but but definitely definitely different slightly different trends that could be tested okay thanks okay yannick was uh, next yeah. Uh, well, thanks for the stimulating uh, uh, talks with an S. I think that there were a few uh, few points, different points addressed. Um, one maybe general question regarding the experiments. Um, 
is it well documented the fact that when uh, reaching the Greenwald density limit, then the, there's a shear layer collapse? Uh, is it something which is uh, well documented or? I don't know of any experiment that looked that did not see it. I mean, I know, I know there is, uh, Martin claims they did something on, on CMOD or C that was never published. Then there's HL2A, there's JTEXT. Uh, I have heard through the grapevine that a shear layer collapse has been seen on ASDEX upgrade recently. I'm not going to reveal my source, but uh, you might think uh, of who it might be. Uh, let's see what else. So those, those are four cases, and I would say corresponding phenomena. It's not Greenwald per se, but corresponding phenomena at the density limit in the Stellarator have been uh, reported by TJ2. So... And those are only, I, I don't know of anyone who is either a tokamak or a stellarator who looked and didn't find it. Yeah, that's maybe the, the issue. So we, it may trigger uh, experimental measurements uh, for sure. Um, may I the, a, problem, yeah. the problem is simple. The problem is that you have a bunch, the people studying density limits don't find it in their hearts to study fluctuations. That's mm -hmm. the problem. And then my, my question was related to the, uh, the shear layer collapse. Um, is it really uh, the cause uh, in your model of the, uh, um, of the density limit or, or it just go, go along uh, at the same time? Because uh, if you, you jump into the adiabatic uh, regime, then uh, for sure the, the transport will, uh, particle transport will, uh, will vanish. So do you really need uh, some shear no, the layer? Particle, the particle transport does not vanish in the adiabatic regime. It becomes, it becomes weaker, but it does mm -hmm. not vanish, okay? And is it the cause? What means the cause, okay? I mean, the vanishing of the shear layer is accompanied by a surge in the particle flux and a, a decrease in the ratio of production of the shear layer to energy extraction from the density gradient. That much is true. And it is accompanied by a surge in turbulence spreading outward. So in my, you know, Maybe you take it to the to the Normalian philosophers, but to my book, that qualifies as a cause. Right? All the pieces. And the point of the distinct, you know, the, the, the point is there is a route to collapse for alpha larger than one. Right, which is a little, I mean, it's very similar, but tech, you know, in the, in the theoretical details, it's a little different. So I wanted to, that's one of the reasons for that exercise we went through. And the larger alphas are gonna be probably where you get the higher currents generally, at least in omics. So that it's in that arena that you see the current scaling emerging. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Azure was next, then I'll squeeze in a few and then Lothar. Uh, I, I wonder if Lothar's question is related to the, to the topic because I'll switch subjects. Okay, so Lothar, uh, is it a follow-up on one of the previous ones? Um, just very quickly, um, the, the experiments also show that the, the, the shear layer is not necessarily monotonically varying with density. So, um, which, which could be understood if you need a certain seed flow shear to make things happen. Um, you need more of that at really low density where, for example, the LH power threshold is really high and you need also a lot at very high density, right? So this is not really talking about density limit per se, 
but there may be non-monotonic behavior there. And my question to you was, do you have a prediction for the isotope dependence of this? I mean, there's, I mean, of, course, there's of course I mean, uh, a hidden one in the collisionality, but is there an explicit isotope dependence? We, uh, we could, we haven't. I knew that was coming. I was just too, too tired last night to, uh, to work that out. We have, the, we have the material for that, right? Because we have the, uh, the, the, uh, the rows all over the place. So mm -hmm. Okay. We can tell you about that. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, right? The, the, the isotope dependence. So. Okay, as you know. Uh, so my question is about this dynamical system you showed, which is like predator prey, but with noise terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that thing seems to have a different than usual, at least fixed points. Yes. Because of the additional terms. And is it consistent with what we know? Did you study these fixed points and are these consistent with what we know intuitively about predator prey behavior like do we when we increase zonal flow damping does it still i don't know yeah, yeah, decrease? but uh, it it's not entirely consistent because it shouldn't be right because it gives a root it gives a root to generation of where is it of the flow without triggering the modulational instability, right? In mm -hmm. other words, you get the flow strictly through noise emission, right? In other words, if you think of the Langevin equation, right? What, what we do with the, with, the, with the thing is, you know, we write down, it's the, it's, you know, the usual blah, blah, blah. You just, you write this, let's call this as d by dt of e zonal. Mm -hmm. And then we have something like minus gamma e zonal. And what, what we do in modulation is this becomes positive and you get growth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now we though, we have noise and you can, you know, that just comes from beats of polarization, v twiddle del squared phi twiddle. And the usual thing is you say, well, but that's a, he's exponential and he's only going to grow algebraically like a random walk when you square it, right? Mm -hmm. This, I shouldn't say E, this is V zonal. But the point is at saturation, he isn't doing anything and he's still there. So he's important around saturation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the critical opalescence effect. The structure, I mean, the structure of the fixed point changes. It's important. Okay. Yeah. And one, of the, one of the things that I mean, I have in mind, and I mean, Brian was, you know, you have to sort of translate into English a little bit, but he was, he was really on in the, in the, the KITP about critical opalescence phenomena. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? I mean, it's exactly where's our little picture of this, that you, you know, you, you, you know, you always have coexistence. You never reach the old modulation threshold, right? Which is over here because of the noise you stay on these curves. So it, it, it does make a difference. And uh, that's all there in living detail. We can, uh, the other thing that's interesting is uh, the dynamics of zonal corrugations as, as opposed to flows, which if you're interested, you know, you could imagine there, you just go to a, uh, have stationary corrugations and you have the staircase. And the uh, last but not least, the thing that's interesting is the zonal cross correlation thing, which uh, uh, appears quite prominently in the theory. So we think that's important. I mean, and uh, I think that's something, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, it, I, th I would find it hard to sell a staircase story based on wave kinetics anymore, knowing what I know now. Uh, I think Bly has some merits because it's so beautifully simple, but really I think it's time to move beyond Bly. So that's, that's the coming, coming activities, you know. <laughs>
We, unlike you, we occasionally have to do something useful for the system, Oscar. <laughs> All right, but you're welcome. You're welcome to to join Ramaswar and I if if that amuses you. So, okay, thanks. A bashy bazook joining us. Anyone else? Yeah, me. Um, oh. I don't see anyone, so I'll I'll squeeze You've in. You've been quiet That's because we had no French impressionisms here. Uh, I mean, no, I'm not quiet. I'm I'm chair, so I defer to uh, everyone. Uh, that's. That's uh, you know good practices, I guess. Um, you you mentioned that uh, the key part is uh, the collapse, uh, not the uh, it's the depletion of of drive. Uh, and um, of course, uh, I'm sure you have thought about it. But is it an effect that would come through uh, the intensity uh, or through the phase of the fluctuations? Or and, more uh, the phase. More the phase, the alpha, that's the point of my little sermon about breaking the relation between the wave propagation and the momentum flux. That's the phase. Okay. And uh, you, you can, well, the, the shear can be uh, produced either in the pedestal, in the confined region or, or in the scrape off. And, uh, well, here we're in this story for the, the this is the shear in the pet in the confined region yeah, in the yeah, pedestal. Exactly. exactly but you probably can have also a similar one uh in the pedestal and in the in the in the scrape off and in the real life you have both so uh can you can you uh, scanning i don't know that it goes to to what xavier i, I guess was asking uh, scanning neutrals or scanning uh, things like that uh, you can probably damp the uh, scrape of generated uh, flow and uh, not so much the, the pedestal and uh... my impression I mean we had I uh, heard a talk recently it was from D3D it's the word of God right and uh, uh, about how pathetically feeble the neutral penetration is so you know, so I think it's it's possible that running with a lot of neutrals would kill the scrape off layer, but not the uh, not the the pedestal zonal mode. Yes. Okay, so it's really from what you you, you see, it's definitely a pedestal generated uh, uh, flow, and it's uh, that pedestal generated uh, collapse that would be majorly responsible for for the well, what. What is seen is is the shear layer collapse and in, inside the se the separatrix or last closed flux surface. Yes. Okay. And uh, to to uh, clarify, uh, maybe uh, the the basics uh, the basic phenomena could play around. I'm sure you thought again about this with uh, imposing uh, RMPs or magnetic perturbations because there. You have the uh, the Maxwell stresses that would also come into play, and uh, uh, yeah. well, uh, let me make two com. Yes, we've thought about that. Uh, dealing with J text is interesting. Let's just put it that way. Uh, has its moments, but we're going. There'll be we're going to have a proposal on that in the upcoming HL two A run. All right, and but I would caution you, speaking of phases, to remember our friend Samantha, who you heard in KITP, right? Uh, in other words, that a stochastic magnetic field can degrade the cross phasing in the Reynolds stress. So that could trans, so if you add that to the mix, that it's not just a matter of Maxwell stresses, it's a matter of phase decorrelation of Reynolds stresses. Mm -hmm. And that could result in a lower achievable density. But that, that could also very much clarify whether it's MAG driven or uh, you know, your, uh, your interpretation to uh, transport uh, driven. Yeah. I, I think what you do want to do cl to clarify that is a causality. I mean, I don't think this is mutually exclusive with MHD, but this is where we're saying is that the cooling that starts the trigger of the, the march of, to the MARF and then to the tearing and all of that may be due to enhanced turbulence and enhanced transport. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
But really what you need to do is some kind of thing where you lay out the time evolution and see who happens when. Thank you. And uh, okay, I'll give the uh, floor again to Lothar, uh, then Özgür. Oh, Xavier, you had another one also? Uh, maybe it's a follow-up, just uh, if, if you allow me on this discussion, because I, I had a, connect, a connected question. Because independently of RMPs, uh, I think that at some point you discarded electromagnetic turbulence based on the fact that beta is small. But if I would be Bobo Scott, I am not, but let's assume he would argue that what counts is uh, some kind of beta star, you know, made up with uh, granite lengths. And there you may arrive to a situation where uh, a turbulence becomes electromagnetic and then the Samantha story comes in, that is stochastic phalanx and also collapse of shear layers. So did, did, you, did you think when I Mm. Yeah, we we did look at that, and I'm I'm I understand that point. It's uh, when I say beta, it's, it's a catch-all for. Mm. There's no way I, looking at the numbers for like this HL2A experiment. There's no way we can justify resistive ballooning. Mm -hmm. Okay, no even way. accounting for gradient. Even accounting because the density, the gradient is not. You know, it's beta over L sub p or something, right? You're yeah, saying yeah. 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 Not steep enough. I see. Okay, Luthor, you have a second one. Yeah, I mean, I, I was also intrigued by the, the the potential ramifications for negative triangularity because there you have, of course, um, at the edge you have an L mode like edge, and you you the 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 line average density may be very similar at the density limit if there is one, but the edge is very different. The other thing we find is experimentally that the there's similarity in the TEM behavior at the edge. I'm not talking now about the omnigenous effects in the core, but just the edge. But there's dissimilarity in the ITG drive, which is, seems to be stronger in comparable um, positive triangularity modes than in the negative triangularity ones. So, so um, it seems to be pretty much uh, TEM driven story in the edge at negative triangularity. Do you have any any comments or any speculations how that would affect the shear layer collapse if there is one? Yeah. TEM versus ITG? Yes, uh -huh. because it's an L mode edge, right? So there's not really yeah. uh, kinetic ballooning I'm, or anything like that. No, I, but I, I mean, I think I don't, Qualitative. I mean, there'll be a quantitative difference, of course, but qualitatively, I don't. I don't really see much of a problem. Mm -hmm. It's just that the density doesn't get at the separatrix anywhere close to the the equivalent H mode limits in positive triangularity, right? I mean, the confinement is similar, beta is similar in the core, but you do this at much lower edge density. Well, it may be, I mean, one wonders if, if perhaps the, she the shearing is not strong enough then to, uh, to get there. I mean, if it's T, you know, the way I would say, if, if the agent is really TEM, generally the zonal flow production is weaker, right? In TEM than ITG, right. is it? Mm -hmm. So a weaker zonal flow would mean a weaker density you could achieve if you go down this road. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I mean, that's, I haven't thought much about, uh, you know, that's about the question of uh, even, even L mode that's upcoming. So one of the things I want to do is n even without negative triangularity is to look at L mode to kind of separate power and particles as the drive of the turbulence. Yeah, and L mode is of course much harder to get to get to equivalent densities at the edge, right? So, I mean, it's uh, unless you really overfuel the system, make it really cold, right? So. Okay, well, I had the last one and maybe we relax you afterwards. Um, if, if what you're proposing is, uh, uh, is what's really happening, uh, should uh, I mode not be a, a choice candidate to look at that? Because if you, uh, if you have uh, 
if the story is uh, you, your heat flux drives uh, an off-diagonal density uh, flux, the fact that you have a different uh, you know, heating profile, but the same density uh, profile than in L mode should uh, give you a, maybe a different, um, uh, well, I'm not sure about, uh, about the, the, the question, but... Um, the, oh, the well, I, I am sure about the answer. It should be looked at. And there's a line on that in the paper with Rima. We did, in fact, make a comment. Because in I mode, in I mode, you know, there's, uh, you have this, what do they call it? The weakly coherent mode, right? And what is it? The way I see it is it's a wave packet and a gam. And in some sense, the question there may be the robustness of the GAM in the I mode may replace the issue of the robustness of the shear layer. Okay. So it's an ideal venue to test the scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, I have to think some more. Okay, are there any more questions? Doesn't seem to be. So, well, thank you very much, Pat, for a stimulating talk. And, um, well, let's uh, reconvene uh, next Tuesday. Thank you very much. <laughs>